couple things that I want to do before uh, we get into the uh, rest of Chapter 11. Uh, I have some homework to hand back. A uh, homework uh, four written homework. So this is everybody from letter C uh, down to letter F, C, D, E, and F. Uh, starting with C. Uh, is come on down to the front, Isabella Car Carolyn. Isabella, are you here? Where are you? <coughs> Abigail Chirico. Okay. Thank you. Sebastian Channel. Sebastian, are you here? Okay. Let me turn these lights back on. Okay. Andrew Clavet. Andrew Clavet. Uh, James Clytus. James. Uh, get my specs on for this one. Uh, Christian Caffalato. Something like that. Uh, Marcus Colon. Richard Colombo. Okay, there you go. Nathan Cook. Okay. Kiana Cordova. Okay, there you go. Uh, Alicia Cornejo. Kenneth Booth. Angelica D'Souza. Anthony D'Elia. Are you Anthony? Yes. If you have last name, or last, last name D, E, or F, get down here. Otherwise, you're not going to get your homework. Trisha David. Gabby De Leon. Okay, here you go. Jessica Dennis. Okay, here you go. Andrea Diaz. Gabriela Diomede. Michael D. Paolo. Paolo. Brenda Doe. William Dolan. Brian Doss. Lorenz uh, Dye. Okay. Sarah Eberly. Guillermo Echari, Guillermo, Kyle Edwards, okay, there you go, Daniel Eisenstein, uh, Salim Elbara, Elbana, Tyler Elliott, Ty Back to work. Uh, first thing I want to, or second, second thing I want to go over uh, with you is uh, the grade situation as it stands right now. Now I updated in case you haven't seen it. Uh, homework and everybody. All, I should say almost everybody. There's a few drips and drabs of. Uh, people whose homework is on vacation somewhere on my desk, but I think I got everybody, almost everybody. Uh, we got best two or three midterms. So here's something nice that I, I'm really happy about. 95.7% uh, of the class took all three. That means you get to drop the low one and you keep the two good ones, all right? And that usually raises your grade for the grade for everybody. That, that does that. Now, students who took at least two, that's 100%. So everybody in here is taking at least two. Great. All right. And so 72 points possible in your best two out of three uh, row in your grades page. Okay. Now, we also have homework pointage 
And I updated that today. I finally got everything graded and in there. And so that's going to be, uh, we, we've had 18 points, five two-pointers and one eight-pointer for everybody. Now, not everybody had the same eight-point assignment. But everybody did did have one. Plus, we had the free uh, pre graded one. That's another eight points. So we're we're kind of adjusting the uh, the homework situation here as we go. Twenty six points possible on the homework scores. So we convert that uh, by percentage down to third or up to thirty six points today. But we're gonna have another homework assignment, and you may have already downloaded it. I hope you have uh, homework X to replace. Uh, one of your stinky homework grades. Anyway, so for instance, if your sum of your homeworks right now is 16, uh, that means you get uh, out of 26, that means you get 23 out of 36 in the pointage column. Now we also have participation pointage, which I er updated earlier this week. And all these things are, are, you know, are temporary. You know, we won't be finished until next Friday. All right, but for now, this is a nice snapshot. 36 questions so far as of like Monday, uh, and we convert that down to 12 points, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what I want to uh, point out to you is two things. First of all, this is without lab scores. And I know that there's a lot of lab scores out there. Everybody in here has got a lab score, but I don't have any of them. And I won't get them until those GTAs, so diligent and, and hardworking, uh, get the grades to me. And that'll probably be sometime during exam week. All right, the other thing I wanna point out, we've got more clicking and homework ahead of us. So uh, your homework grade might change a little bit, your, your clicking grade might change a little bit, but probably not a whole lot, you know, because most of the activity is in the past, so only a little bit is in front of us. All right, now any questions about that? Yeah, question. Well, this is, this is, don't say anything about that. But zip zap. You can ask me that after class. All right, I got all that squared away. But another, because some people here aren't aware of that. All right. Uh, another question. <laughs> okay, now I want to show you what the grades would look like um, uh, if I were going to give grades today. This is how they'd stack up. Uh, and this is without labs. So, I mean, you know, most of the classes that I teach, I don't have the lab grade in. Um, so, and I'm, I'm not able to put a lab grade in yet. But just regular points. And so not include, I didn't include any bonus points. Some of you have some. Some of them I'm still working on. Uh, but uh, for regular points, this is the way they look. A lot of Bs, as you can see. You know, not too many As. And only a few Fs, only seven Fs. All right, and two of those Fs are people that haven't been coming to class and they haven't done any exams or, or anything, so they're in there too. Uh, but uh, average right now is actually a B minus, 75.7%. On this stuff, homework, participation, and exams. Now factor in your lab on top of whatever you have here, and who knows what, and I know there's a lot of variation in the lab grades right now All right but anyways this is a snapshot kind of a sneak peek estimate your 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 final grade for the semester will be complete after the final and after i get the lab grades and put them all together now questions Yes. Huh? 
120. We have 72 for two exams, 12 from participation pointage, and uh, 36 from, uh, from homework. Okay. So it's 120. So you can figure out what your percentage is, you know, and, and it's 50% it's, uh, passing, 60% C, 50% D, 60% uh, C, 75% A, 90% or 75% B, 90% A. So, but I usually go by points. So, don't ask me to round off your grades or anything like that. All right, no more questions. Let's talk about written homework X. Now, this is the one that we've been talking about for the past week and a half. Okay, it's up in web courses. Look on the homework list. You'll see it. And it's about an oscillator system and two different oscillator states. And you're going to ask, you're going to have some questions about that. You have the technology, but you're going to have to think your way through it. And I know that there's a, a group me that homogenizes homework. And, you know, everybody does the same solution method. Which you know I don't I don't really like to see that there's nothing I could do about it but I do give you this warning I do give you to, to I say this to all of you um, if you're a if if you're used to using that you're going to be sol on the final because you won't. my son texting me we got tickets for the magic playoff game so so he's all excited about that uh if you're used to using group me and and you know and it, you know like on homework four i saw a lot of people using kinetic energy stuff before we even talked about it so i know that came off group me and that came off Khan academy or something else okay you're free to do that but on the test you're going to be sol good luck to you you know, you can't think for yourself. You copy off everybody else. That's all right. Homework's not a big, big deal. I made homework small to, for that reason. All right. Exams, you know, 72 point final. You better be on the job. You better. Be, so use this homework to study. Now, what you're going to do on the homework, you're going to designate which of the eight point ex, uh, homework uh, assignments you want this score to replace. So A, if you have a seven out of eight on homework five, and you want to get an eight out of eight for this one, that's fine. But you know, you, you have to decide how much time you want to devote to it. If you have a two out of eight on homework three, then go for it. If you have an eight out of eight on your, you know, your eight point homework, don't do it. Or just do it, but don't turn it in next Wednesday, all right? So you can use it to substitute for any of your, you, you, you can, for any of the eight point assignments, and that's different for each group of students. Chelsea. What do you think? What do you What do you guys think I should do? Drop it or, or keep the big, keep the highest one? Yeah, that's that's what I would do. Another question. Go ahead. Well, the original plan before I before the you know I was I had to leave town for a week uh, was to have two eight pointers, and ten two pointers. Okay, total of 36 points, and we had to we had to change that plan midway through the semester. So now we have five two pointers and one eight pointer. But every, you know, every, you know, I, I collect them in groups of alphabetic last names. You know, so C through F, they had homework four. A through B had homework. I don't know what they had, you know, homework two or something like that. So, uh, but if you have a stinky problem for homework eight. Now, let me just also mention this. If you haven't got all your homeworks back yet, 
um, talk to your lab TA because they're supposed to be getting returned through the lab TAs, all right? And I don't know what happens to them. Sometimes, sometimes uh, homework takes a vacation in my office, and it also takes a vacation in the grad student's office. So just, just quiz them and see if they can dig it out. All right, now that's up. At, you, you'll see this diagram. This is kind of the key, a diagram and the key. And it's actually a two-page uh, PDF, but you're still going to submit all your work on the first side. Okay, this diagram is on the back, so you, you can think about it, you know, visualize the stuff. And I, su I suggest you redraw the diagram on the front page. Neatly. Oh, by the way, homework four, the skier uh, flight test. I asked you to draw a, uh, a uh, what do you call it, a free body diagram. And oh, my goodness, there were a lot of little teeny free body diagrams, so small I could put my thumb over it and cover it up. All right. Now, I frown on diagrams that small. All right, so when you're drawing your ellipses on the front of the homework, uh, don't don't make them gigantic to take up the whole page. I mean, you got to put some stuff in there, but don't make it too tiny. That if I put my thumb over it, and some people I actually they, I I wrote that my thumb was bigger than your diagram, and their diagram was off. I had to take points off. But if you had the diagram looking okay. And your number, I let your numbers do the talking, even if your diagram was a little small. So now let's get some uh, discussion going here on pressure, density, and velocity and fluids. The thing, this is chapter 11, and we're going to dash up into chapter 12 because chapter 12 is where you find Bernoulli's equation, which is this one. And Bernoulli's equation. Pressure, P, this is a version from the textbook, capital P for pressure. I usually use lowercase p, but one-half rho times V squared. Rho is the uh, density of the whatever the fluid is, and then plus rho GH. Now, does that look like anything, those second and the second and third term on the left? It looks like energies. It looks like one-half MV squared, but it's not. It's one-half rho V squared. And it looks like MGH, potential energy, but it's not. It's rho GH. All right. Now, there's a reason for that. And next week when we dip into Chapter 12 and start tackling Bernoulli's equation, uh, we're going to want to uh, understand everything about that. And my usual uh, kind of landmark for Bernoulli's equation is to understand dynamic lift. This equation... Um, the fact that it's a constant at every point in a fluid uh, can be used to derive the amount of lift, the amount of pressure, force per square meter that you get on the wing of an airplane. Because the airplane's going through a fluid, air we call it, usually it's air, and there's a pressure differential between the top and the bottom, and it traces back to this equation. So we're going to be trying to understand dynamic lift. But before we do that, we want to get some more concepts down for pressure uh, and, uh, and, and stuff like that. Now, here's a nice uh, diagram from 11.3. This is figure one. And it's just a colloquial example of how pressure, um, you, you know, you, you exert the same amount of force into this guy's shoulder. But if one of the objects is your fingertips, then it's distributed over, I don't know, maybe a square centimeter of fingertip area. But yet if you, if you jab him with the same amount of force with a very small diameter syringe needle, you know, that's not even a, a millimeter. Well, it might be a millimeter if it's a big one. Okay, a small one's going to be even smaller than a millimeter. Um, you get a lot large pressure, and what that does, you have the same number of force per unit uh, area or a bigger number is you have the same amount of force but a smaller area so the ratio is uh, much larger so you have a larger pressure for the uh, hypodermic syringe and uh so it breaks the skin now if you if you poke somebody with your fingertip you're not going to break their skin 
All right, and that's why a knife works the way it works. You know, you're carving up some pizza or something like that. You know, some ribs. Whew, steak. You know, you gotta you gotta use a sharp knife, right? So what the, the whole point of the knife is, the knife edge is you hone it down to a fine edge, and that means you have along that line you have a very small surface area. And that allows you to cut through the, the muscle fibers in the steak, uh, et cetera. All right, so uh, now another thing that I want to bring up to you is that the forces that a fluid exerts on the walls of its container, you know, whatever the container is, they're usually perpendicular to the surface, okay? So the surface can have any shape. And at any particular point, you can construct geometrically a normal vector, you know, a, a perpendicular bisector, basically, to some little segment of surface. And then the force, the net force is going to – and the reason for that is all these little molecules or atoms uh, blazing around, either in a, in a liquid or in a gas, um, they're pretty much going in all directions – they're randomly distributed as to direction, and they're randomly distributed as to speeds. So the momenta are randomly distributed, and it's we consider it to be isotropic. And that means that in any direction that you care to, to inspect, this direction or that direction, you're going to have the same amount of momentum going in that direction. So the ricochets at any given surface – or little pixel of surface of the container, the ricochets are always going to add up geometrically, trigonometrically. You do the calculus and stuff, which you guys don't, you know, most of you don't have the calculus to do that, but it's, it's, it's like third semester of calculus, maybe second semester. And you, you get all the, all the, the net vectors and stuff, and you, know, you get a zillions of them, you know, like 10 to the 23, and uh, they're hitting it all different directions, but they all add up to you know, perpendicular. So the delta P that the wall gets from all those ricochets is basically perpendicular to the wall every time. All right? Because you have, you know, the same number coming in from this angle is coming in from this angle, same number coming in from, the, you know, symmetric angles up here. And so you're always getting, you know, a good, you know, perpendicular net from each pair of uh, particles you care to discuss. All right? So that's... That's the uh, isotropic symmetry of the momentum. And that's actually a pretty important topic. Now, if you're – sometimes you're in an, in an environment where you have to factor in gravitational potential energy gradient. And in that case, you don't always have the same pressure at every point in the fluid. All right? And – so a case is, you know, taking a submarine like this down to the Marianas, the bottom of the Marianas Trench. Okay, the deepest point, the Challenger Deep, you know, the, the deepest point that we know of in all the oceans of the Earth. It's over on the other side of the Pacific in the Mar by the Mariana Islands. Right, and this is, uh, you know, the movie director, James Cameron, he directed Avatar and... Uh, Titanic and a bunch of other. Oh, he just he he directed this one really cool movie called The Abyss, where they have these creatures from down below the sea and everything. And it's a very cool movie if you ever watch it. That's about twenty something years ago, but it's a cool movie. Anyways, he this this is his submarine, and he 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 had it built uh, so that it could withstand just one man, one man submarine to go all the way down to the bottom, which he did. And here they are going. Um, I think they're testing it here. That's not one of his one of his deep runs, but one of his test runs. All right. So the fluid pressure changes with depth. And if you think about it, you know, a, a submarine like this, if it's going to go deep, it has to be really strongly built because the pressure inside has to be near one atmosphere for us to breathe. Okay, for the the submariner's got a brief. So, so he doesn't have a whole lot of pressure in there. 
So if if he had equal pressure to the seat pressure at any depth, you know that he go, he could, he could handle that. You, it would be hard to breathe and stuff, but you could do it. And and we have done that actually with um, divers. Uh, NASA, I think, was the first one that fooled around with it. To you know when they were getting ready for the astronauts and stuff, they they made an undersea base uh, like a hundred feet down, and it was the bottom of it was open. You know, and they pressurized the air so that the air pressure kept the water out. And so they could just dive in. It's like a swimming pool, and you dive into it, and you swim out from underneath it, and you're out in the, the, the ocean about 100 feet down. And they could do that, but not all the way down to the Marianas Trench. So that thing has to be built really, really ruggedly. And that's because the water, uh, the, the weight of the water above you increases, if you think about it. And so that's what this... This diagram, this is figure one from chapter 11-4. You know, it's just a tank of water, right? And so the, the mass of the water is just the density of water times the volume above any surface that you may care. Or, you know, or, if you, or think of it this way. If you fill it up with more water, you know, you increase the water column. So that's a variable H in this diagram. Uh, that's more water, so more weight. You know, so if you only have an inch of water down there, the amount of weight on that surface area A is pretty small. If you have two inches, you have twice as much weight on that surface area. So the pressure, the PSI, the newtons per square meter on that surface area A down there increases for every inch of water that you add to the tank because there's more water in it, so it's more press down force. All right, now the formula for that in the textbook, rho times GH. Oh, part of Bernoulli's formula. Yeah. So Bernoulli's formula factors in the fact that uh, the pressure increases with depth. So if you're looking at an airplane wing, you're, you're talking about two different uh, vertical positions. You wouldn't call it depth, but, I mean, you know, above the wing and below the wing, you know, a few inches apart. And believe it or not, a few inches apart for an airplane wing will lift. Did you see that that? Falcon Heavy liftoff yesterday. They say I heard on the TV that that baby can lift a 737, fully loaded passengers, fuel, uh, cargo into orbit. Oh my goodness, what a what a rocket! But anyways, for a regular airplane, a few inches of you know delta Y and different fluid velocities and stuff above and below the wing, you're going to get a, a, a huge amount of lift from air pressure. All right? It's because of, partially because of this. Now, here's the way that I usually read it, write it. Pressure is rho times G times Z, where Z increases with depth. All right? So Z equals zero is at, is at sea level, and Z equals uh, 10 is 10 meters below sea level. All right? Now, if you've ever been um, scuba diving, you know that um, if you go about 10 meters down, about 33 feet, you have a whole extra load of atmospheric. So it's two atmospheres down there. You got the regular atmosphere of the, of the Earth's atmosphere pressing down on the water, and then you got 10 meters of water pressing down on top, below that. So it, every 10 meters, you get another atmosphere of pressure. So it, it builds up really quickly. All right. And so another way to think about this, uh, this particular diagram, if you were to drill a hole in the top of this or near the top up here, uh, let me get my cursor over here, uh, near the water line up here, uh, the pressure there at that level would be fairly low. The pressure down here at the bottom is pretty high. So if you drill a hole here, yeah, you're going to get pressure pushing the water out of the hole. But it won't be great shakes. But if you put a hole down here close to the bottom, you know, that water is going to go, you know, out really fast because it's higher pressure. Okay. And that so that's another way to, to judge the pressure state at different levels. All right. Whether you call it H or Z. Now, here's a cool diagram uh, from... Uh, chapter 11, 3, this is figure 3. It's a swimmer, and he's underwater, right? 
and there's a bigger upper pressure force per unit area down at below the swimmer. And if you look at it carefully, go ahead and make a note, figure three, chapter 11.3, um, the arrows that are pointing up, they're pointing perpendicular to his surface. You know, the, the, the artist here was very careful to make the arrows in the below the diver about the same size, but oriented to the surface. And so if, if you think about it, the pressure on his surface uh, from the surrounding fluid is also perpendicular to whatever his body contour is. All right, so all those arrows down there are bigger. So these babies down here are bigger, and they're tilted in various directions, but basically up. I mean, because he's not doing a cannonball. He's not jumping straight in feet first or head first. He's kind of, you know, swimming horizontal. All right, so the, the forces, are, the upward pressure forces uh, are, uh, are pressing upward. Now, over here, he's got a, a pressure, you know, this one's going to give him a headache right here. He's pressing right into his forehead. Right now, up here, he's above him uh, on the back, on his back, and you know, on his the back of his leg and stuff, the back of his head. Uh, smaller arrows because up a few inches, much less pressure. All right. Now he's roughly got the same amount of surface area top and bottom, and he's got some surface area his left side and his right side. All right. He's got some surface area for his forehead side and for his heels all right so there's pr there's pressure forces there but the the lateral forces are going to balance out because they're going to be at the same you know you're going to get forces from each step left and right and they're going to balance out the ones that don't balance out are the ones on the bottom and the ones on the top all right so that means you get a net upward force and this is where buoyancy comes from, all right? So if he's holding his breath, you know, if, you, if you're ever swimming in the pool and you hold your breath, you, you dive down, you know, from the side of the pool or from the diving board or something like that, and you hold your breath and you, you get in the water and you, you go way down, you know, you, you know, dive down a couple, three feet or 10 feet if you're going for the high dive. Um, but you're holding your breath. You don't have to do anything. You'll rise to the surface. For most people, okay, you know, your lungs will, you know, and plus, you know, plus your, your body, I don't know, human body is naturally buoyant, even if it doesn't have full lungs, but you fill, fill up your lungs, you got a lot of air, plus your natural buoyancy, you're going to rise to the surface, all right, and, the, and it's for this reason, all right, now, the, the exception to that is, what if he puts on a weight belt, okay, now, scuba divers, they have to put on a weight belt. And the reason they do it is so that they have, they put on a weight belt so they can add a little bit extra downward force arrows so that they can balance all the big force arrows from below. So they got a whole bunch of teeny ones above. Then they got the weight belt, okay? And the combination of that, hopefully, if they do it right, will balance all the big ones from below. And then they're neutrally buoyant. And then they can swim up and down without having to fight buoyancy. They can just go wherever they want. All right? And that works out pretty nice. And it's, it's not perfect. You know, if you go really deep, you have to have a different weight belts and stuff. But that's what weight belts do. Okay? And if you put on too much weight, you're going to sink. You're going to have um, negative buoyancy. All right? But neutral buoyancy is what a diver is going to want. All right? Also, I was reading about these pearl divers, you know, like over in Japan. And they dive without scuba tanks really deep. They hold their breath, and that keeps their, their entire insides pressurized. It's like being a little submarine at, at atmospheric pressure. Um, and they just dive way, way down in the ocean, you know, 50 feet. I, I was able to, when I was, uh, you know, a kid, we, we did a lot of uh, snorkeling and stuff. I could dive down 25 feet, but that's about it before I had to come back up. All right. 
Um, read it to chapter 12 for your homework and get going on homework X. I'll see you next week. If you didn't get your homework four, come on down here and I'll give it to you.